So this session, working together to achieve green, affordable housing, what we want to do is take some notes towards the Cairo Declaration. And as you, as you all know, and we've been talking about over the last couple of days, every year when the African Union for Housing Finance comes together at its annual conference, it takes the notes of what's been said at that conference and puts them together into a declaration. And that that declaration gets voted on and agreed by its members at their AGM, at their annual general meeting the following day. So tomorrow, the members of the AUHF will be meeting for the 38th annual general meeting, which is quite amazing when you think about it. For 38 years, the AUHF has been promoting and driving affordable housing conversation on the continent. Um, and they will vote on the Cairo Declaration. And we are going to be busy putting one together this evening. Um, and the reason that we're doing that is because we believe that there have been so many good ideas that have been voiced in this forum, as they are every year when we come together, and it's like a mandate that we can take forward and, and drive the affordable housing agenda on all of our behalves, each of us. And so we do try to capture that in a declaration. At the same time, there are colleagues work who are constantly fostering communication and engagement around these issues, not limited to the African continent, across the globe. And we've got a bunch of sort of connecting circles of, of conversation that is hugely enriching and supportive and really, I think, is something worth harnessing further to drive our objectives. So this panel here, we have um, members from the Way Forward Coalition and the African Union for Housing Finance. What I'd first like you each to do is just introduce yourselves in this new context, because everybody, I think, it, it knows you otherwise. Um, but in this context and towards our conversation around the Cairo Declaration, just an opening introduction, um, and then we'll, we'll carry the discussion further. Patrick. Okay, great, thank you, and it's great to be here. It's always a pleasure to come, and it's so nice to see so many friendly, familiar faces and meet some new people and um, have these great conversations. My name is Patrick McAllister. Um, I actually work for Habitat for Humanity's Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter. Uh, I couldn't work for the Way Forward Coalition because the Way Forward Coalition is, in a sense, virtual. It doesn't have any staff. It doesn't have any format. What is it? It's a, it's a group of people who have decided to come together to deal with the complexity of affordable housing. Um, and and I, it's unfortunate that uh, Professor Maria Hoek Schmidt couldn't be here um, because, in a way, this is all due to her. Um, and here you see the website of the coalition. Um, but one of the things that I think is, has been important for the coalition and just generally for us working together across these vast geographies on these incredibly complex issues is it's nice to have a place where you can sort of come back and regroup and try to figure out the difficult questions. And I think that's what the Way Forward Coalition is trying to provide and I think has in, in some ways provided. So that's why it's important for an organization like Habitat for Humanity to to have something like the Way Forward Coalition um, around. Excellent. I'm going to ask Deborah first, um, because also you're with the Way Forward Housing Coalition, and maybe talk a little bit about, yeah, introduce yourself in that context. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think of, I, I think of Way Forward Coalition like a community of practice, um, individual professionals who have been involved in the affordable housing space globally for a number of years and who have perspectives across a wide spectrum of um, stakeholders within, within the industry. And it's, it, it's a great opportunity to, to talk about the issues in a more um, informal and free thinking way to pull in the resources that we have access to and um, bring those to the table to think about ways that we might help 
though those of you here and other countries um, address the challenges because obviously what we've heard every time I come to one of these conferences I'm like oh my god how are we going to do this you know <laughs> um, so <clears throat> to help us break down some of these issues and try to come up with plans that can help everyone address them. Great, thank you. Tandiwe. Hello everyone, my name is Tandiwe Dlamini and I'm the AUHF coordinator. The AUHF is a member-based organization and they've brought us here. So the AUHF meets every year and uh, this is one of our main events. What we do is we focus mostly on bringing the community in across Africa who's working um, on affordable housing and housing finance and uh, try to, cre to create that environment, that networking environment, come and uh, speak about key things that we're working on. Uh, the AHF also works on um, well, the, 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 dif the different, um, the different uh, members, we've got members who are mortgage banks, we've got members who are developers, we've got members who are individuals who are really um, thinking about how best to, to, to solve the issues of affordable housing and, affordable and housing finance across Africa. They're bringing in their different uh, activities and they're bringing in their different um, experiences to us. So the AHF mostly we are working on collaboration, we are working on engagement, we are working on promoting what different stakeholders are doing and one of the main things that we do is we organize uh, events uh, for the members, we organize uh, that collaboration space, we come and we, we showcase what is happening across Africa, we learn from each other actually as the AUHF, so that is what we are doing, we are a member-based organization and um, we, 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 we have the CAF as the secretariat and there is a synergy between CAF and the AUHF because uh, CAF being the think tank of, of, of affordable housing. So this is one of the events that we have and we are glad that we are having this, taking it forward into the three um, committees that we have, the Lobbying and Advocacy Committee, Lobbying and Advocating uh, for Affordable Housing across Africa in, on the different levels, that is the regional levels, the national levels and uh, bringing it down to members. And one of the things that we also do is we also have an investment committee which we saw and we're trying to say, let's come and talk about um, the different investments that could come up and what are, are the things that maybe uh, are the different developers and the different uh, investors are looking for, especially looking at affordable housing and how can we work together to help each other grow, help each other uh, be effective in the different workspaces that we're working on. So the AHF basically is there to create the opportunities, to create the engagements and um, that is the discussion we are having today and going forward, uh, whatever we are saying today, the declarations, the commitments that we make, what are we going to do out there and um, yeah, basically that is generally what the AHF does. Thank you. Patrick, one of the things that started the Way Forward Coalition is, is that first piece of research that was done um, and that sort of set out a, a, a lobbying and advocacy agenda for the people who agreed who bought into the ideas of, the, of that work. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, so uh, like I said, at, at Habitat, we're fortunate to have uh, Professor Maria Hochschmidt on our advisory board. And, um, you know, we were talking about the importance of housing to the economy and why that's not m more uh, well understood. And Maria, who also runs HofiNet, as many of you know, which collects data, she said, well, the data that governments have available to them isn't, um, isn't good enough, it's not detailed enough to really understand the housing's contribution to GDP. And so we asked her if she could write a paper about that, and she did. And that became known as the Cornerstone of Recovery paper, um, which, which went on to show that, in fact, housing contributes much more to GDP than governments believe it does. And so that, like you're talking about advocacy, I think that kind of led us who were part of a conversation about that paper to believe that we could maybe help governments see the importance of housing to the economy. Um, and we then followed that up with another report on the importance of housing to employment and job creation. And that's, I think, when we as a, as a, as a group of people started just talking to each other regularly about that and, and I, I must say that I don't think the advocacy part of it has really taken off because, in fact, it's complicated for 
all of us working in our individual institutions to join together and try to approach government as one voice, but um, each of us individually does that. And so this research and the conversations that we had around that have helped to focus that message that we're all sending individually. I mean, maybe, Deborah, that's something that you can comment on because you're with DFC and DFC has its own set of rules and it's a very big institution. Yeah. And yet you have participated very generously in these conversations. And so that link between the institution and the individual, and I would argue that, see if you do as well, is that in fact the advocacy, it will, might not happen directly as we the way forward coalition, or, but that it happens in the way that we're each of us influenced in how we then engage in our own, with our own counterparts. Yeah, it's an interesting um, balancing act because all of us represent different types of institutions and, and we're limited. You know, I work for the U.S. government and so I as an individual am not authorized to be speaking with governments on, on behalf of DFC or the U.S. government. So in my role with Way Forward, it's more being involved personally so that I can share some of the challenges we're facing. I can get perspectives from other members of the coalition, and perhaps we, as a group, come up with ideas as to how best to approach governments on the issues, you know, that a, a number of issues that we've raised here. So, not necessarily solutions, but maybe finding ways that we can facilitate, um, you know, a full ecosystem dialogue with local governments in order to drive some of these initiatives forward. And if I could maybe just ask Mari if you have, if you can click on the member, um, the member tab here on the website, you'll see we, you know, it's difficult for any of us, um, you know, to represent our institutions, you know, in this way, but together we can have these conversations that influence all of the work that we do. Um, I mean, I find it's, it's, it's a really nice club of people, <laughs> which in fact is also what the AUHF is. And, and Tandiwe, maybe you can talk a little bit about, can you talk a little bit about the, the character, the voices of your members, of the members? Um, and towards, we're now moving this conversation towards the Cairo Declaration, but maybe a, a just talk a little bit about the character of the membership of the AUHF and what you hear them telling you. I want to just warn Patrick and, and, and Deborah of the next question after that, was I'd really love your thoughts towards the Cairo Declaration and then to warn the audience because you're next. I'm going to ask you that too. But, okay, so. So the AUHF is very unique in its nature and its membership. We have um, financiers who would speak differently to perhaps investments and the products that they are offering in affordable housing, especially to the lower um, affordable housing, that is to the lower people in the, in, uh, in, in the, the lower income people. And then we also have uh, different um, members who would then always come and say, as we talk about affordable housing, yes, we do have the mortgages, uh, we do have those products, but can we also try to have a menu like in a restaurant format where we have products that are relevant to all the different people in, 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 in our community. We do have mortgages but probably they would represent a certain percentage but uh, one of my members um, who, who deals a lot with uh, microfinance uh, that is Mr. T Stephen Wanjala. I'm sure most of us have, 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 uh, have engaged with him. He would always say when we talk about affordable housing, let us have a menu. And in that menu, let, let's make sure we have uh, that particular person we are focusing, who is a local Mwanainchi, if I'm saying it correctly, in, 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 in Kenya, who is a local Mwanainchi in um, Mukuru, for example, what does that mean? What does affordable housing mean to them? Are we also focusing on the end user who is an ordinary citizen in our particular work, in our particular products? Is that when we talk about green, are we also focusing on that local developer? It came up in some of the discussions. 
is that what we are heading towards? So our membership is very broad. We also have in, in, in Nigeria, for example, we have Mr. Festus who couldn't make it, unfortunately, bringing in the different stakeholders, bringing in the, the, the government, for example, the government stakeholders, what are they saying and about affordable housing? So generally, it is all about having different characters. We have different types of membership. We've got membership from across the globe. We've got membership who would come, for example, um, from the finance, fi fi financiers, we've got our developers. We also have different kind of membership. If I've, I've responded very well to, to yeah. your question, Casey. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I mean, I think that what we do here, and you've heard it here, is that diversity is so useful yeah. because wherever any one member is sitting, then they hear about what other members are doing, and then that creates the opportunity to refine their products and services. Um, or to partner, and we see lots of partners, partnerships that have been that have been developing over the over the last few years as well between members, which I think is also what the Way Forward Housing Coalition is trying to do. We figure out ways of working with one another, um, and yeah. Can we talk a little bit about the Cairo Declaration because we would really like some help about how to take this forward, um, and there is a set of questions that are around housing, around affordable housing, around green housing, and then also around collaboration. And all of those are important. We've emphasized them over the course of these two days. Patrick, would you like to offer some comments? So the thing that comes to my mind in a lot of the presentations that we've seen is the complexity of what we're trying to tackle. Um, we just heard it, um, you know, in the PPP presentation, uh, you know, the complexity of putting together those types of deals. We heard about it when um, uh, Egypt was presenting its example of affordable housing finance and the, the complexity over a very long period of putting that together. So I think there needs to be an acknowledgement of the complexity of the task ahead and as somebody said, you know, doing it, just doing affordable housing is hard enough. Doing it green is even, you know, more difficult. So I think maybe that was Rusmir. But um, so I think the complexity should be acknowledged. I think the lack of data that we're faced with in trying to tackle this complexity is also a critical issue that needs to be addressed. I just spoke about it in terms of um, housing and the economy. I know it's something that's near and dear to your heart. I think some of the, um, the developers and the investors in the room have talked about it. So I think those two things, the complexity and the data required to deal with it, I feel like are, are things that resonated with me in this, in this conference. Excellent, thank you. Deborah, would you like to, to comment? Yeah. Um so I, I think maybe we should stop talking about affordability and green or sustainable as separate things. I think it should become one agenda. Affordability, sustainability, they're one and the same. If, if a house isn't sustainable for the, the owners or the occupants, then it's not affordable. Um, and it has to be affordable for those of us who invest in development, it has to be affordable for governments, so that would be the next piece for me would be how do we <clears throat> how do we develop a more effective interface between the public and private to interesting ways because on the public side you have local and national and even global you know housing isn't that far up on the agenda for you know CIP 27 for example it wasn't talked about it, it's a real effort to get people to realize how much of an impact housing has on sustainability and you know all the ESG goals uh, across the board. It's still not really recognized in the broader community. So it seems to me that getting the local and regional governments engaged with the full spectrum of private sector stakeholders, including communities and you know individuals. Is, is really important. So if we can come up with a good mechanism for facilitating that, it would be a huge step forward. Great. 
I mean, I, I kind of think that's what we've, we've got here, right? Is that what, that's what we're trying to do. Let me ask this now to, to everyone here. We're at the end of the day, um, and I want to challenge you to now help us with this. I would love some ideas and thoughts for the Cairo Declaration. And you know what a declaration is. You start by declaring. You say, we declare that these issues are important issues to attend to, and this is what we think that the DFIs should do, that the government should do, that the AUHF should do, and what e we, each of us, will do. And I'd like to invite comments from the floor. I see a couple hands. Um, I'd also like to invite all of you to write one down on a piece of paper. And if you want to sign your name to it, that would be really cool, because then we could talk about it further later. But write down the ideas for what should be in the Cairo Declaration on a piece of paper, and let's also have a discussion now. Joe. <laughs> I'm offering you my mic. There you go. Good. So, um, very naively, it was for me an eye-opener yesterday what you asked um, if, like, attaching green conditions to housing finance if that is not ultimately excluding parties like you brought up the example of a smaller contractor or a smaller developer who might not have access to greening solutions whatever the case might be um, but it obviously goes further what if say all the big funders in the room here decide okay they will stop doing non-green funding what will happen then and at some point you might yeah, actually end up raising the bar uh, in terms of housing and you might um, end up only having privileged inner city developments or close to metropolitan area developments actually being able to still carry on. Um, until yesterday when you raised that, I was under the impression that, or yeah, under the naive impression that greening would bring additional funding, like from carbon emission, um, certificates or something like it would bring additional funding into the affordable space and not so much divert funding away into only exclusively green things um, and I, I don't know how to word that but I would hope that one can somehow bring that into the declaration that greening should not be at the expense of having more peoples without decent ho homes in the end Absolutely, that point, the greening that greening should not be at the expense of. It can't be because greening is the thing that creates more, that that is what, what makes it more affordable and more accessible. But I would suggest maybe that what we would need, and Deborah, this is something that you and I have been talking about for years, is that to enable, to prevent s smaller players being crowded out, we need to provide support to that segment of the supply side so that they can deliver to the standards that the capital will require. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just say that's something that, you know, developers, especially smaller companies that we work with, they know how to build, they know how to develop, but we're layering on, you know, social factors, you know, environmental compliance, all the IFC performance standards layered on top of that. And now we're talking about adding green on top of that. And uh, they don't really have the capacity to do that. So I, I've been wanting for a long time to support some kind of effort. And can I just add, oh, sorry, can I just add to that? It's, it's not just the small developers, it's also the communities. They face that same issue, I think, because it's, it's hard to go in and talk to a community. Somebody needs to develop the, the community to speak with a voice. And I think that piece also is, is really critical. Any other comments? Hala. Yes, please. Uh, uh, when we started our social housing program in, this, uh, in 2014, we didn't have the concept of green within our uh, strategies. And uh, when you go to our uh, communities and new, in new cities that we have launched, green is not that much. But there is green, but not that much. Um, so we started with affordable housing. And then 
um, in 2019, we started the concept of green. Uh, what we are going to visit tomorrow in the um, new capital and the uh, and, uh, capital gardens, um, you will find that we have introduced the concept of green in it. So once you have the affordable housing is there, and it's built. So you start to improve and you start to work on it towards what you want to achieve. In 2019, we, de we decided to have green in our projects. Our projects are not in new cities like that, but we are in, in new communities in the new cities. We are in between industrial areas, working areas, and also the uh, living for higher people and higher luxurious uh, settlements and things like that. So all of the community wants to have green in it. It's not the affordable housing by ourselves. The whole community wants to have green. So the concept have enlarged. And it did not depend on us in affordable housing to have green by ourselves. We have improved the notion. And now we are running for more and more. We started by 7,000 units. We are targeting 25,000 units in 2023. And by 2025, we are targeting another 25,000. We started by the GPRS. And now we are heading, heading the age. I mean, once you get the concept of the affordable housing, and you start after that improving. But we have to start with afford a decent affordable housing that's acceptable for living, that you change people from having um, slums and uh, uh, these informal uh, settlements into affordable, decent housing units. This is one of so what you're saying there is by thinking about it, and that was only seven years ago, by thinking about it, you started to build and develop further, and then now it's become part of standard practice. So it yes. was mainstreamed, yes. ultimately. Yes. Which I think is something that, that um, Dennis and, and Rosmir, both you, that's what you're talking about, and what you've been working so hard on also with your website, which is so useful, is to demonstrate that through case studies and stories and the data that you're collecting, right? <laughs> Something also that Ben mentioned um, from Real and that Tilda mentioned from Estate Intel about collecting that data to demonstrate the case of, of, of the experience. Yeah, it, it's not easy. We have lots of pits and falls at the beginning, but we are moving. We learn from what we have already and we are trying to improve. So it's, it's a learning procedure that we build on. It would be very interesting to compare your developments pre-green, post-green. Yeah. And to yeah. see what the difference is in the savings to do that math. Yeah. Any other comments from the floor? Any other thoughts about what should be in our declaration? I see some of you are writing. I hope you're writing to me. Yes, Tilda. Um, thanks, Cassia. I think for me, it's just um, br bringing or picking up what I've had several speakers saying um, from a selfish perspective, but also an important one, um, proposing that there should be a way to bridge the data gap. I think um, I've listened to almost everybody say there's no data in Africa, there's no data, we can't find any data. So there should be um, an initiative to bridge the data gap. I know um, Center for Affordable Housing is doing something. Estate Intel is doing the work. Uh, multiple people are putting in the work. But um, the fact that this is all siloed and very specific to what people are doing, then I think that's how it comes up in a sense that there's no data and people can't find the data for what they're doing. I know the open access initiative is there, but maybe bringing together a forum where us as market industry um, data providers, which we are as Estate Intel, what CAF is doing, and everybody just coming together and providing that data, 
I think moves the needle just a bit in terms of this is where we are as Africa in the different markets and this is what is going on and appreciating those initiatives because the data is available. So, yeah. Now that's excellent and one of the things I'd, I'd quite like to weave into the, in, into the declaration also because of our, my own focus in this context, but is to weave in, we, the people, agree that we will share our data in promotion of affordable housing, and to see if the AUHF members sign that, um, while also requesting that all the other stakeholders do the same. Rusmir, you've got a comment. Uh, from my part, and, and I, may, I may not speak for all of IFC, but I think it's Im important to really understand the standard. So what do we mean yes. when we say green housing? And, um, and make sure that that standard is connected to the green finance. So there was a lot of good conversation around climate bonds initiative, uh, International Capital Markets Association. Those are the ultimate standard setters, because if you have a standard it's just your own locally and you can't access international finance, that's not going to help you. So I think having a conversation around agreement on a standard with a ambition at least to go to net zero because and now with IFC we're showing that you actually can have low income housing that's fully powered by solar and it just creates a, a different way to treat that asset, right? That maybe the price is higher for the structure itself, but if you have no utilities, you know, you're not paying any utilities on that house, how is that being treated by the bank? How is that being communicated to the, to the ultimate buyer? So having that discussion would be important. I'd say from IFC, I think we can declare that we will continue to train for, on both ends, both on the mitigation side and resource efficiency and including our new tool, Building Resilience Index, that's gonna look at disaster preparedness as well. And then looking at things like water as actually being a climate adaptation strategy for many, many countries, right? Doing the water efficiency, there's long-term effects of climate change that are not disaster prone, but are still gonna be important. I, I, I take that point for sure. And I think that, um, I think I mentioned earlier today about a fear about tail wagging dog. And we do have to watch out for that because there is practice on the ground, which means I think also that our standards, which are critical, because otherwise, you know, we have, if we're measuring something, we have to know what the unit is, right? Um, but have that be responsive to how housing is delivered so that we enable a much broader participation in that, in, in that process. And Tandiwe, I wonder if, if you can talk just a little bit about what some of the members are doing around green that is actually happening, um, whether or not it's being measured in that way. Okay, just to mention some of the things that our members are doing. We have uh, 14 trees. 14 trees is working on uh, a 3D printing, and they've been working around their product and uh, the cement, trying to make it um, all green across. And they, we also have some of the members like uh, Block Solutions. Block Solutions has been working on a different kind of uh, technology. We've seen them trying to introduce this in different governments in South Africa. They were recently in Namibia trying to promote that as well. We have some of our members who who are working um, together, Casa Real, um, Easy Housing, uh, who, are working, who are working using a different technology of timber. They've been doing that in Mozambique, and I know that they were launching some of the houses in Uganda. They're actually spreading across different, um, different uh, countries in Africa. We have some members who've been investigating and trying to learn from different um, countries, for example, to see how they can work around uh, sewer degeneration around that and probably implement it into their, into their projects. We have ZNBS who have gone through to learn from um, an organization in Kenya and they are, they are implementing that into their ho affordable housing project. So we do have also, IFC, IFC is also a member of the AUHF and we all know about IFC and the course that they've been offering, which is for free and uh, which I would encourage uh, 
uh, most of us in the, in the building to actually sign up for. It is still for free, right? Uh, yes, so if we could still sign up for it, we'll put it up again on the AHF website. We've been talking about it, so perhaps getting that, that, that uh, knowledge will be quite great. We've got NMRC and we've got KMRC. We've been also focusing on uh, uh, green financing as well. And yes, uh, that's just a handful, but we do have quite a lot that is happening in the space uh, looking at green. So that's a lot of experience that, in fact, it's our job now to document and share back into the sector and see how that shapes the green conversation going forward. Any other comments around the, the Cairo Declaration? Anyone want to, has not been heard over the last two days that would like to make a point? We have people here from Angola, from Cameroon, from Gabon, from, sir, you would like to make a point? Thanks, Mary. All the way there in the back corner. From Kenya and Tanzania and Nigeria. Zimbabwe, Zambia. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Botswana. Botswana. Uh, we are a delegation from Botswana Housing Corporation, which has got about 10,000 uh, houses um, in the country. Uh, we are part, we are a parastatal, we are part owned by government and a company that was owned by government. Yes. Yeah, but uh, we, we see that uh, earlier on we were, when you were discussing uh, triple P's, we were talking about the, the student accommodation. We were very curious about how does the business case for the affordable student accommodation uh, happen? How or, does the business case? Yeah, yeah. How is do you it, present the business case? for? Yeah, is it a, a practical viable model uh, in, in, in the African context? Uh, I'm also a lecturer, so I'm curious about where students live. And there's a big deficit, but most of the parents in Africa don't, can afford maybe school fees, but they cannot afford um, the accommodation as yeah. well. So uh, students end up living in more like ghetto kind of environment, you know, very low income areas. Um, so I think that uh, addressing the youth population of the country, of that should be a major imperative in sustainable urban development. Okay, that's a, very, that's a very interesting point. And in, for some companies, student accommodation is the segue into affordable, actually, is the way in which they find their way into affordable, depending on, on the different economies. Any other comments from any? No, we're at the end of our conversation, hey? It's either a lot or <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And in which case, it's a lot. We'll see you next year. <laughs> Great. There is one. I have to let this woman who's had her hand up at the end of every session. Thank you. <laughs> Please, ma'am, will you introduce yourself? My name is Branca, and I come from Angola. As um, a delegation from Angola, we have one concern. Mm -hmm. In Angola, we don't have a mortgage, a mortgage market. Uh, we represent a, one property developer, and um, for us, affordability matters because 70% of the population uh, is, works in the informal sector. And uh, it is uh, very hard to sell the product even to construct, because the commercial banks are not um, available or doesn't feel comfortable to provide loans to the entrepreneurs. And uh, being in this kind of conference where financial issues are discussed, 
and be aware that some, in some countries, already African countries, already the mortgage market functions and the private sector with uh, its dynamism put things in the market for the communities, uh, make us think that we have a long work to do to, to, do, to be in the same level as the other uh, African countries that are here represented. And for us, in the declaration, one sentence about the necessity of the government in general to organize or to organize uh, or to build the environment, macroeconomic environment, mm -hmm. for access to, to ex for the existence of a mortgage uh, market and uh, the families accessing to credit to sell or rent uh, affordable housing, it would be very good for us. Thank you. Absolutely, and I think the person who will stand right next to you on that one is Simon Wally. Um, to have an enabling environment um, in support of developing mortgage markets. Two more comments in the back, and then I'm going to release this crowd to our closing, and I'll call up my, one of my board members to give a vote of thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Mrs. Jean-Paul from Cameroon. This is a Cameroon Housing Loan Fund from Cameroon. It is an institutional financial company which provides loans for low income. Mm -hmm. And one of the most biggest issues is the informal sectors. The informal sector. The informal sector. Also have an issue of land access. And this is our first participation in this general assembly. And I hope that we are coming back very soon because we found it very interesting. Uh, probably got some some uh, how do you say? Business cards. Yes. I've collected some of them. So <laughs> I'm quite sure that I'll get in touch at get in contact with all those people and then try to build partnership. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you so much. The informal sector and land are issues that are common across so many countries and you're right, very that's hugely critical. A comment in the far back? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Padron Gotora. I'm from Zimbabwe, the Minister of National Housing and Social Amenities. Uh, it could be far-fetched, but I would suggest that uh, we set a declaration on setting minimum indicators for green buildings and sustainable development and also green mortgages and uh, the green bonds. Thank you. Thank you very much. One last comment there, and then Mayada, you're next. Right back there, one last comment. I did say only one more, but suddenly the room is alive. <laughs> Thank you, Keshe. Thank you, Keshe. <clears throat> so my, na my name is Tamoka. I'm also coming from Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm with a financial institution. And what we normally try to do is create financing for individuals. That's, that's our core business, to invest in mortgages, to invest in property, renovations, and so forth. Um, over the last few years, what we've noticed is that whenever we are seeking finance as a country, um, as a bank rather, from your DFIs, your, your Pan-African funders, the funding tends to be quite expensive. And I think these funders must make a deliberate decision to make this funding affordable. And in classifying risk, I think the individual country risk factors must be considered in their own context. So, for example, I come from a country where we've had inflation, where we've had differences in functional currencies that we use. And at times, if the financing that you're getting is in a specific currency and suddenly the people who've borrowed are no longer able to pay back in that kind of currency, 
we need to be able to have structures that can allow um, these individuals to continue paying in their affordable currency and then have these funds ring fence for another project that this financial institution, so this DFI, could be able to utilize. So, for example, if CABS had gotten funding from Afrexim or from Shelter Freak, for example, in repayment of those funds, they could instead be channeled to another project in Zim instead of not necessarily having to come back onshore. Perhaps looking at it from that perspective would make the cost of financing a lot cheaper and then we can be able to pass on these savings to the eventual borrower on the, on the ground. But I think it's just an issue of making a deliberate decision to consider individual country factors when these aggregators are considering finance for the countries. Thank you. Thank you. And I think in that, con you're, it sounds like you're saying a bit of a, a, a country-based portfolio approach in terms, of, in terms of investment. I think that Chris Candy, in the if he's still in the room, um, might want to have a conversation about that, the African Local Currency Bond Fund. Mayada, I think you get the last word from the room. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a suggestion. Um, I don't know if the declaration uh, can include a suggestion, but uh, my uh, suggestion is about um, maybe we have uh, an interactive map uh, on a platform, maybe it's uh, a UHF uh, forum or um, uh, another platform, in order to combine all uh, stockholders in Africa, uh, government, uh, startups, um, um, banks that are working on green or financing, um, to make it easy for them to partnership or uh, to, uh, to cooperate uh, together, to find um, each other easily. Um, so it's, that's my suggestion. I love that. That's a great idea. So a way in which actually it's just like a, 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 a networking site specifically around the topic. I think that's something that the AUHF could do very, very quickly. Hmm? Um, any last comments from, from the panel? Like Debbie said, it's, there's too much to say, so better just say goodbye. <laughs> Do you want to say anything about the Way Forward Coalition and how people might engage with you? Uh, the only thing I'd say... Oh. Here, take this one. Uh, the only thing I'd say about the Way Forward Coalition, if you're interested, is just go to the website. Uh, there's a way to connect there. It's, like I said, it's a, it's a very small group right now. We're, we're actually a little bit more internally focused than we are externally focused. Um, however, we, we, are, we are publishing blogs, so if people want to write about the work that you're doing, we'd be happy to, to talk to you about, about publishing a blog on that. Um, but like, like I said, on the website, there's a way to get in touch with us and we can, we can respond, so. Well, I think I have a kind of a, something in the way forward that I would really like to try out, and that is local coalitions to find a country that might be interested in working with us to set up a, a local coalition of stakeholders to engage with government on affordable and green housing issues. So if anybody has an interest in that, I'd love to talk about it. You want to just say something about India? Because we're sort of doing it in India. I yeah, yeah. The, 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 there, is, there is one that's been set up in India, and they're, they're doing a great job of it. Uh, I, I don't have all the details, but it's a good example of what can work, and, and they have already set up some very effective engagement with um, government entities and um, what do you call them, state-owned enterprises that are involved in the housing sector generally. So it's, it, is a, it can work. Great, thank you so much. So as the AUHF would welcome, um, would, I wish to invite anyone in the room who's not yet an AUHF member who would like to learn from you, from your experiences, both the great experiences and not so good experiences through the various uh, uh, collaborations that we have. We do organize webinars and if you have a topic that you wish for us to uh, incorporate, please come forward, do get in touch with us. Um, I'm sure my email address is org, and you can go to our website also pop in um, yeah pop in some comments and let's collaborate let's let's engage let's let's take this green forward and let's have more, more discussions thank you
So please, if I can ask my team, just if you can circulate through this room and collect any of those sentences that people have written down for our declaration. And Mildred, can I invite you to come up? Thank you very much.